Good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us once again for our weekly PPD session. Uh, this is the final uh, PPD for phase one. However, this is definitely not the last opportunity. There'll be other consultations we'll be doing throughout the development of the framework to get your views. There is, um, just to mention that there is a Google uh, survey form that is available online, the MCTT website that can be used to give your contributions. And uh, letting everyone know that this uh, webinar is being recorded and will be later shared on the MCTT website for everyone to contribute. Uh, so colleagues, our topic for today is future opportunities for tourism entrepreneurs. And the objective for today's webinar is to learn insights on business opportunities for the workforce, learn from experiences of entrepreneurs and tourism professionals. We'll be sharing lessons learned from challenges faced and opportunities in the market and discuss the tourism industry's perspective on entrepreneurship and relevance to future development. So colleagues, we would like this to be a very interactive session um, as your contributions are very valuable in terms of developing this uh, framework. Uh, this is not the uh, ministry's framework alone. This is your framework. So please, we are looking forward to your feedback and comments. So as we go along uh, the session, we would request that you put in your questions or any comments you have in the chat box, and uh, we will discuss it as we go along. Um, so there's two parts to the session. The first hour will be contribution from the panel, and the second hour will be Q&A session, but we are not restricted to putting your uh, questions in the second hour. You can put it in the chat box as we go along. Uh, colleagues, um, our speakers for today is Higher Development Director, Mr. Joshua Matewai, Vehicle Lodge Owner, Ms. Alenwa Nimandere, Mix Fiji Tours and Transfers Managing Director, Mr. Sitiveni Nawanga, Domica Adventures Manager, Ms. Matalita Katamatu, and the Coffee Hub Managing Director, Mr. Zoro. So before I go on to introduce our spe first speaker, as per our usual practice, I would request everyone, if you could please turn on your camera so that we can have a photo session that will be uploaded on our social media page. I'll just give a few seconds for everyone to turn on your cameras, please. Okay, can I see some more faces? Okay. Okay. We have a big bullet smile. And here we go. Thank you so much, colleagues. So our first speaker for the day is higher development owner, Mr. Joshua Matewai. He has financial background and has worked for MDF, Itoki Land Transport, Home Finance Company Limited and has vast experience and skills in business development, consultancy, stakeholder mapping, market research, private sector development, and business planning. So today he will be sharing with us insights on the current business entrepreneurship space and where the demand is in the market. So Joshua, you have the floor now, sir. Naka Vinaga Jutishna, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in uh, today. And uh being part of, and uh, thank you to also the organizing committee for inviting me uh, to come and speak on the topic that has been uh, put before us. Also, uh, uh, lovely to see uh, familiar faces as well that are with us uh, today. So for me, just for these first 10 minutes, I believe as uh, mentioned by Tushishna, looking at the demand, uh, the gaps, as well as uh, what opportunities are there that uh, tourism entrepreneurs can take advantage of or look into as well. So just, uh, what Jatishna has uh, introduced uh, earlier on um, with my experience and some of the work that I've done. I've been um, working around uh, offering business trainings, business coaching, as well as providing technical assistance to a few of the incubators and accelerator programs that are available right now in the market that have been operating as well after COVID-19. And some of them are the Fiji Commercial and Police Federation, Fiji Enterprise Engine. The, I believe during COVID, uh, ILO had uh, run uh, similar incubation programs for the tourism workers that were laid off, also part of the training as well, uh, providing training, part of uh, assisting, providing training as well to the Web CAWE program during COVID-19. And currently I'm um, 
part of uh, providing technical assistance as well as uh, facilitation of the uh, triple GI, GGGI Pacific Green Entrepreneurs Network program, the incubator and accelerator programs, as well as the Blue Climate Accelerator that is currently ongoing right now. So just that's just a bit of uh, things that I'm currently doing uh, in consultancy here in uh, Fiji, as well as uh, a few countries in the Pacific. So uh, from uh, the topic that has been given, I believe that uh, during COVID-19, um, tourism has been badly affected and that's what we have, um, um, uh, the reports that have been uh, coming out and also with the recovery uh, of uh, Fiji's economy, I believe tourism plays a major role in that as well. However, in this recovery process, uh, with, I believe it's, uh, it's going to be different with the change in the market demand, market preferences from tourists, overseas tourists, as well as local tourists as well. And as uh, put out by one of the, um, uh, the WF World Economic Forum, I report that was put out is that uh, the, the recovery process has to be much more inclusive as well as sustainable. And that's where the uh, global tourism market is heading towards. For, from my perspective, as well as what I've been seeing is that three key things where the shift is going towards the demand. One is all travel is wellness related. Okay, it's not just about um, much more just vacation, but for wellness and for health purposes, that is where uh, for every tourism tourist as they travel, it's sort of how uh, all related to wellness. Secondly is um, for consumers, for tourists, especially the younger ones, younger generation, and also the older ones, they are much more looking at the impact, um, aware of the impact they have as they travel, as they go and uh, stay in places, as they visit or stay on holidays, vacation, that's what they're looking at. Not only on the environmental side of things uh, aspect, but also on the social and the impact on the communities that they will go and live in, or they'll be uh, part of as they travel and spend the holidays. And thirdly is one of the positive impacts of the pandemic is that uh, people are looking for more local experiences and are spending more time with communities. And I believe we'll hear from a few of the community-based tourism operators after this and the experiences as well on that. And that is where the demand is going towards. They want more local experience, which are authentic. Okay. Um, and that, so the concept of community-based solutions, community-based tourism um, is obviously, obviously one that puts community at the core of every development, okay? ensuring that the community engage, they're empowered and they benefit as well from the uh, tourism activities. And those are three of the key uh, shifts that are, that are moving towards right now in terms of a global tourism market. And we can also experience it here locally as we see a lot of community-based tourism um, businesses that are popping up, um, uh, that are popping up or becoming more popular during COVID and after COVID as well. Now for you as tourism um, operators, as tourism entrepreneurs, um, from the advice or things that I would recommend is first and foremost is have a real look at your business value chain. Okay, that's one key thing. Have a real look at a business value chain right from the, the source market, okay? Right from what you offer, where you get your raw materials from, where you get your, uh, where do you source your people from? Okay, that business value chain right to your business activities. And as you assess and analyze your business value chain, aligning it to what some of the key things that I've just mentioned, okay? Keeping in mind the consumer demand and preferences okay? that are wellness related, that are um, looking at uh, in, engaging more of our communities, involving them more um, in the process of business value chain. And one, another key thing is one thing that will help you apart from the research that you do, apart from your uh, network, uh, talking to other people is being part of programs uh, that are currently on offer uh, at the moment. That will help you to take a step back and relook at your gov at your business uh, processes, business chains, a business value chain in, as part of that. And there are currently uh, programs that are on offer right now, incubator and accelerator programs that will help you to assess your business uh, model, your business plan moving forward and aligning it to what is the is the shift towards right now for tourism, tourists locally as well as overseas. Now, one of the questions that was posed to me as well, 
in the email that I got is the, the business gaps that the local workforce can take advantage of uh, and what needs to be done to support the growth of entrepreneurship and skilled labor. Okay. And um, I believe this question was centered around the, 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 the influx of uh, labor workers, local labor workers overseas, those overseas mobility workers. Okay. Um, what are the, the gaps from there? And what are the opportunities that you as tourism uh, entrepreneurs, I know you've been affected by that, I believe, uh, from the reports that have been going out, uh, especially from our um, Fiji Commerce and Police Federation, from some of the reports and, um, that I've been reading, the, the influx of workers just leaving. Okay, while there is a um, not so positive side to it, but uh, from my side, looking at as well, keeping it balanced on the positive end of things is one of the gaps right now is the reintegration program for those retaining workers, in, for those retaining workers back into uh, Fiji. Okay, uh, the reintegration program. While I'm not really familiar what is currently at the moment um, with our Ministry of Employment, but some of the recommendation and some of the work that I've been involved in, uh, not in Fiji, but in, um, in uh, Kiribati is the, the trying to develop entrepreneurship skills for these overseas labor workers. Now, this is not only when, uh, this is not only at the end when they are there in overseas and they're coming back and then we try to uh, build, develop, their capacity in entrepreneurship doing business, but it is actually from the starting point, from the recruitment and the pre-debacher stage, it is very important. Because, uh, and, and incorporating entrepreneurship uh, programs along the way, as they're here in Fiji, as they work uh, in Australia or New Zealand, and as they travel back, uh, back uh, into Fiji, what are the entrepreneurship programs that are incorporated into that? While they leave and they take the, the, the skills, um, and there's a brain drain for those six months, nine months, and those are programs that are going for two, three years, but as well as we can look at the other side of it and see the positive whereby they're able to, apart from just remittances, able to, when they, upon their return, they're able to contribute as well back into Fiji's econ economy as well. That's one, um, um, building entrepreneurship skills. Secondly is, as we all know, like when these young people or when these workers, they travel overseas, when they go and work overseas, um, they get money and they get funding, they get paid for it, okay? My, one of the key things that was in mind in me uh, when I was actually uh, doing this work for one of the uh, Pacific Island country is, is before they leave, is there's an opportunity, especially for entrepreneurs, existing businesses, if they are able to um, have a, in, engage or, um, or or how do you say these workers before they leave make them uh, make them be, uh, go into a joint venture with them in that aspect go into a joint venture with them whereby when they go overseas money that are made they're able to find finance back into the joint venture that you uh, that you and that overseas worker have uh, worked together on or have ventured into I believe that most tourism entrepreneurs, uh, most entrepreneurs in general, finding access to funding is always an issue. While we are, we are trying, um, uh, while there are many opportunities, not so much, uh, while they are um, in, the, in Fiji in terms of access funding. However, this is another opportunity whereby as before these people, as maybe in your communities, maybe your family, okay, as, they, as, as you hear them traveling overseas to go and work, uh, to be part of these overseas uh, mobility workers and making them involved in the business whereby they can become a, a part owner or a joint venture, they become an investor in your business and having that arranged before they actually leave. So those are just some opportunities that you as tourism entrepreneurs can look into as well. Well, uh, some might be happening informally, okay? but I believe there's a lot as well in there whereby other entrepreneurs can look into that. And I know we, we are somehow related to villages, to young uh, people that are going overseas or to a family member that we hear of that are going. And we know that they make money as they go there and they send money back into Fiji. While we don't know how that money is spent, but one of the key thing is before they go is already, uh, is already um, identifying for them that you can come back and instead of starting up your own business, you can already invest into this existing tourism business that is here already. And then becoming a a part owner or investor into that, into your business. So those are just some of the things um, that I see as uh, business opportunities. And those are some of the demands 
that I'm looking, that I've uh, noticed, that I've um, um, identified as well uh, moving forward. But um, that's just setting the platform, and uh, I believe the other speakers will speak into detail in terms of their business and how they see the shift in our tourism uh, preferences uh, for their business as well in Fiji. Thank you so much, Zutishna. Thank you so much, Mr. Joshua, for joining us uh, today and sharing your experience and insight into the market demand and customer preferences, also highlighting on the skill gap and, and, and the labor force mobility and the challenges faced and the opportunities that's available for the entrepreneurs. Thank you so much. Uh, Alex, our next speaker for the day is the Mr. Zoro, the owner of one of the country's most popular eatery, Coffee Hub Fiji. He is also the winner of the 2022 ANZ Fiji Excellence in Tourism Awards Rising Star category. He is a certified based star trainer by profession and he is very passionate about making great coffee. From Zoro, he'll be sharing his experience of successfully scaling a tourism business, lessons learned, and actions and support needed to support others to scale. Uh, Mr. Zoro, you have the floor now, sir. Sorry, you are on mute, uh, sir. If you can Just unmute. One moment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You can me. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for giving me this amazing opportunity to be able to share my experience. Um, thank you so much for the beautiful introduction. Uh, so for me, um, I'll tell you more about the insights of how I actually started my business. Um, I started off my uh, my career as a barista back in. Uh, 2011 at Glory Jeans here in Suva. And uh, from there, my passion grew through making coffee, um, serving people, and basically just learning uh, the stages of uh, what happens inside the hospitality industry. Um, with my past experience from cafes to work in a resort, I was able to learn as much as I could. And uh, it became a dream for me to be able to own a little cafe one day. So um, as much as life threw a lot of opportunities and obstacles towards me, um, I kept on going and learning as much as I could. So back in 2019 is when I had decided to um, quit my full-time job as, a, um, as I was working for a coffee distributing company. So that's when uh, what I started doing was probably a year before I had quit my job, I had started collecting a lot of um, cutleries and crockeries and things needed to start up a little cafe. So uh, 2019, uh, December 25th is when I put my um, foot down and made a really big decision in my life is where I started, I opened my doors to a little cafe with two colleagues that I started the cafe with. And um, I basically started operating from day to day operation by using the resources which I had around me, from doing my um, shopping through the supermarkets to uh, using whatever I had in my house to do my interior decors and uh, my knowledge, which was the experience that I've gained previously. Um, that is what I offered to our people. And um, Tourism was still active back then, and then COVID had hit. So that's where there was a shift in my business where I started focusing on uh, the local tourism, basically. And uh, Coffee Hub became a destination where people could escape from the real world to, uh, to de-stress, to brainstorm, to come up with ideas and innovate and try and adapt to what was happening around us. So uh, for me personally, with my business, how I scaled from three staff to basically today, I stand before you with uh, approximately 180 staffs and four outlets. Um, I have one um, in Lotoka, one in Ba. Nandi is the foundation outlet for me, and we've got Suva. We've, uh, we're just uh, still uh, going through the stage of offering as much as we can. Um, scaling through my business in the tourism sector was um, adapting to what we had around us. Um, 
for me, I had hired a lot of experienced staff from the resorts. Um, these experienced staff came in with a lot of knowledge and what they had learned in the resorts. And um, most of these overseas uh, staff as well who had returned back home due to COVID and things like that. So I gave them a platform where they could um, showcase their talent and uh, uh, show their knowledge and ex experience of what they have learned through their journey as well. Um, that was one of the major things that uh, I used and I gave them this platform. And uh, some of the lesson, uh, lessons that I learned through this journey is ad uh, adapting. You have to adapt very quickly to what is happening around us. So in terms of businesses, the government, the customers, more importantly, what the customers want. And, you know, um, the social media plays a vital role for us. So um, this generation that we live in today, they're very... Um, very, uh, they're, they're very knowledgeable of what they want to consume, what they what they would uh, expect when they go to a cafe, or um, uh, the, uh, the hospitality, for example, the food. So, so when I talk about uh, evolving, so it's not just about, for example, giving you a a plate of fish and chips. It's, a, it's the way you present it, it's the taste buds, the way it looks, all these kind of things are all integrated in this particular dish. So these are some of the things that I, uh, I focus on. And um, so these are some of the ways which I have uh, evolved my business. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the action plans that I take um, within the business, um, oh, Coffee Hub is not a, uh, we don't go through, it's not like a walk in a garden every day. Every day we come through challenges. Every day we come through customer complaints. So what we do to make sure we fix it. So we have a beautiful policy that uh, we have at the coffee app. So for my team, for the beautiful team who supports me every day, um, I give them this opportunity to treat this outlet like it's their home. So any person that walks through the coffee hub, they should be greeted like they've, before they've walked into your house. They're welcomed. They are sat down, we give them coffee, water, tea, and um, they are given a piece of uh, uh, space where they forget about the real world. They come down and just wanna feel uh, free and relaxed. So that's a platform which we uh, have created for anyone and everyone. And, um, in terms of the, the tourism uh, sector, uh, for me working in the resort, uh, what I have experienced first in is resorts, uh, people, uh, guests that come into the resorts, for example, tourists, they love to go where locals go. So that is one of the target market which I extracted from my experience. And working in a resort, every tourist would come to any employee and ask, where do, where do locals go? We want to go and experience the local things, the local lifestyle, the local food. So what we have done is we are blessed that the locals love the coffee hut. So with that, if any tourist asks the locals, where do you want to go for coffee? The first thing they say is coffee hut or any other cafe whatsoever, mana cafe in Suva, um moments. So these are sort of uh, areas where uh, tourism kicks in initially. So not forgetting our local my, local tourism as well. Um, in terms of supported needed, um, for me personally, I started the cafe from the ground um, in terms of the government platform, uh, just streamlining a lot of things in terms of licensing. Um, what can the, the youth, the the, 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 the young person or any person in this um, industry, what can the government make it easier for them to, to start up their own business? As much as it does sound scary, it is not. So most of the pushbacks are basically, for me, my first place experience is um, getting my licensing done. Um, customer service plays a vital role in every industry, no matter whether you work for the government sector, the health, the cafes, food and beverage. Customer service is a culture. 
that either makes a person or it breaks a person. So these are the things that helps people move forward. Um, in terms of just uh, streamlining a lot of things in terms of getting licensing and uh, if working efficiently, how to get um, approvals faster would be a great benefit for anyone and everyone. So for me personally, that is one of the pushback that I feel that um, a lot of people give up halfway through it. Oh, it's too hard. It's just too complicated, uh, mainly because of they are not um, educated enough. You know, the, the, the knowledge is not shared. And they are not given this assurance. Don't worry, it's going to be okay. Just a couple more documentation you need. Just a couple of these, couple of that, and you'll be sorted. So these are some of the things that I try and help uh, uh, people who come my way to seek for assistance. These are some of the things that I do. And um, these would be some of the requests that I would probably put out there for the government officials. If uh, what can we do to make it easier for everyone and anyone? Um, because I know out there there's a lot of youth, there's a lot of um, Fijians overall who who have who have the knowledge, who have the mindset, but they want they they need these guidance just to to be pushed to the last step. And from there, they'll just flourish, just like I did. And um, in terms of uh, the brain drain that's going on um, at the moment in the government, uh, in the country, sorry, um, what we can do is use a lot of expatriates who come into the, uh, the country, use them to educate our people, share the knowledge and the expertise that they have. Um, that is one of the things I have personally done when I've worked for resorts and uh, other businesses. A lot of expertise do come in into the business and um, their main goal is to share their knowledge and their expertise and um, implement a lot of policies and procedures for the company. But that does not only end there. As an individual, as an employee of the company, I do ask a lot of questions so that I self-educate myself so that I have goals in life as well, certain things that I want to achieve. So I learn as much as I can. I ask questions. Um, for those who don't know much about me, I grew up in Ba, in a countryside. I went to school, uh, elementary school, high school in Ba. I went to uni and unfortunately I had to drop out because I was unable to pay for my school fees. So today I didn't go to university I didn't study the main tool that I use is social media I use Instagram and Facebook tools business tools uh, motivational uh, videos YouTube I use a lot of platforms which we have around me so that's how I self-educate self-educate is a very important key of life you can learn about medical you can learn about businesses you can learn about people, how you interact with people. These are the things you learn overall through social media. And as Fijians, we are very, we are very fortunate that we have the Fijian hospitality within our heart. That's the, God, the gift of God that we have, the hospitality. So this is what we need to bring out in every um, workplace that we have. So that, that's what makes us Fiji unique overall. Um, from scaling uh, my business to where it is today, um, social media has been a very powerful platform for me, um, using that as a form of marketing. And of course, um, working with other businesses out there of how we can work together. So what uh, Mr. Joshua was mentioning, working with your friends, your, uh, your colleagues, coming together to create an idea and uh, and how we can all execute this. So uh, I've worked with a lot of uh, businesses where we collaborate. So it's not about my business, it's about helping somebody else's business as well on the platform. I have shared a lot of businesses on my platform, uh, mostly startup businesses. Um, with the Coffee Hub Suva, I have been working closely with um, a pest control company. Um, so I have decided, I could have worked with other established companies, but I've decided to work with this um, young entrepreneur 
and given her a platform to showcase her knowledge and her expertise. So that is something that I do. Uh, I'm working with a couple more young entrepreneurs just to give them a platform where they can display their products in my outlet. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, um, any questions, any, if, if there's any way I can help, I'm always there. So these are some of the things which I do. And of course, I um, ask a lot of questions as well. Every time I meet people, uh, no matter what walks of life they are from, I try and uh, be that one person. I, be, be, I become the point of contact. For A, I become the, C, uh, the B and there's a C. So I ask questions and then I connect people. So that is basically what uh, I try and do for anyone and everyone. So yes, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Zoro, for sharing your story, very inspiring. And good to hear we are neighbors. I'm originally from the small town of Tavwa. And Guilty, yeah. I'm one of yeah. your customers. It's just a few steps away from our building and the customer service is lovely. So thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you so next much. We will... Colleagues, we'll move on to our next speaker, uh, Mr. Sitiveni Nawanga, Managing Director, Mix Fiji Tours and Transfers, 100% indigenous Fijian family-owned business. He has attained his education from Victoria University. And today he will be sharing with us his experience on taking advantage of business opportunities in the tourism market and lesson learned. Mr. Nawanga, you have the floor now. Thank you, sir. Um, so you'll have to, yeah. Yeah, I just unmute me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, Vinaka, Vinaka Zoro. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of Zoro as well. And he's always a coffee hub. <laughs> uh, yeah, Bula, and thank you for attending this uh, webinar. My name is Sidveni Lesto Nawanga. I hail from Tau village in Nandonga. And uh, I'm a managing director of MIG Transfers and Tours, Ketsa Water Taxi, and Fiji for Me Holidays. So firstly, I would like to take this opportunity to, take, uh, to thank, thank Tourism Fiji in arranging this uh, webinar where young and upcoming entrepreneurs are able to have an insight on our driving tourism industry. So tourism has taken a huge, huge leap in arrival and uh, current figures indicate that we are still expanding in all areas related to tourism. So as two and transfers company found, founded in 2015, we have had a few share, a few things to share of up and downs, but uh, we have rebounded strongly post, strongly post COVID. This rebound has uh, provided us many opportunities in expanding our fleet and also recruiting of more staff to cater for the demand in the tourism market. The company faced difficulties during the pandemic, but it was optimistic. It will rebound. This is a company face uh, is a testimony, a company testimony to the work put in by Tools in Fiji. As a local owned company, we have had opportunity to work with overseas operate, uh, operators, mainly Australia, New Zealand, USA, and also learn from other well-established local operators. So we can only learn from the past and invest in a booming future based on statistic. The current opportunity available in the market indicates that investment worthwhile and an opportunity not to be missed. For those of you that are planning on your next investment, do not hesitate on tourism. Uh, it is worthwhile and investment takes a bold step, which I can only encourage you fellow enterprise to invest in, what, in, in, in while you still have opportunity and the markets are still favorable. Vinaka. <laughs> so I'm, um, so I'm, um, that, that's it. Um, 
I hope you hear me on. Um, yeah, so I owned a, a three uh, a three company called Mick Transfers into is uh, Fiji Limited and Catch a Water Taxi and uh, Fiji for Me Holidays. So those three companies are running in uh, Fiji at the moment. Uh, Mick is uh, it came uh, uh, the name Mick came from a cyclone Mick that hit Fiji in 2009. This aimed by 2009. So most of you will know that 2009, there was a category three uh, Mick, cyclone Mick was uh, hitting, uh, hitting Fiji, yes. So we three brothers, we went out uh, saving my nephew. My nephew was uh, born in uh, Singatoka town. And uh, my nephew, uh, uh, they were evacuated the, the hospital in Singatoka hospital. And uh, we three brothers, we went up and saved my nephew. From that uh, saving my nephew and uh, reaching home, my father named the company in 2015 when I finished uh, playing rugby from Australia. And then we named the company after Mick, Cyclone Mick. So yes, so we are Cyclone. That's why all our all our vehicles at the back, it's written, you're passing another Cyclone Mick, <laughs> not a fox. <laughs> yeah, so that's the story about Mick. So it's a Cyclone. It's uh, uh, the name come after the Cyclone Mick in 2009, December, Vinaka. Thank you, Mr. Nawanga, for sharing your experience and story in, in the business opportunities in the tourism market. Um, very interesting. Uh, colleagues, um, we will, uh, as we go along, please, if you have any questions or comments, please do put it in the chat box. Uh, so our next speaker for the day uh, is uh, Ms. Matelita Katamoto, Domoika Adventures Manager. She is an auditor by profession and works extensively in the private sector. However, also closely works with government schools and charitable organizations. She's also founder and project manager for Domoika Adventures, that is a Matangali owned ecotourism business in the small village of Waiwanga in Namosi, that is fairly nine months old in both the local and international market. So today she'll be sharing her experience on starting up a tourism business and what actions and support are needed to support tourism entrepreneurship. Uh, Ms. Matalita, you have the floor now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jadishma. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, ma'am. Yes, can okay, hear you. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much uh, um, to MC Triple T. I have uh, C uh, for the platform to speak on the area of uh, the industry that we're in. I'm Matelita Katamoto. Um, I'm um, from Namosi, uh, and we am a founder of uh, Matangali owned uh, social enterprise up in Waivaka, which is called Domoika Adventures. Um, we, we launched onto the market on the 11th of June of last year. Um, this social enterprise came to life um, post COVID and it was solely, we solely founded this to, um, to, res to solve our financial woes of the business, of the Matangali. Uh, we were running out of um, the Matangali Trust Fund, uh, which funded um, our, our students' educations in Suva. Um, so over the years during COVID, it was a bad hit. Uh, we were not receiving any dividends payout from Fijian Holdings. And everyone was so worried. There were so many, um, there were so many weddings and so many deaths that was tracking up money um, that they couldn't foresee any other area to, to, to raise the money to replenish what was being used. And it was, it was during COVID and post COVID when the borders opened, um, there was a high demand in local uh, adventures. And we noted during this period, people were going, the borders, were, international borders were closed. They had exhausted all forms of places that they were going to, uh, going for adventures in. And we found that we didn't have much to offer here. Um, so that, that was the reason why we came up um, in June. It took us around a turnaround of two weeks to get the business onto the market. But today I will be sharing the challenges around uh, founding or, or setting up a Matangali-owned business up 
um, in the Highlands of Namos. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone would agree with me in, in the Fijian traditional society, women don't have a seat at the, at, you know, at the discussions. We are always at the kitchen or we're always at the back of everything. We do not participate in this um, Matangali level uh, meetings. And that was my biggest challenge was trying to convince my dad and the senior members that they had to allow us women to come and help them in the area of business. Because statistically, women are more, we had, there was a lot more women um, that had degrees from the universities than men. And we had the expertise to assist. So first was trying to get the men to understand that we could help. Um, it took a lot of convincing. That, that was one of my biggest challenges. I managed to convince my dad and then I had to go to a, a bigger level, a communal level. Um, it took weeks, but before this convincing had to take place, I had to do a thorough research of what was available in the market in the area of adventure tourism. Um, the, that took quite a while. There was a bit of a pushback uh, when it came to the approval side because some of some of the men that were older than my, myself and that were more, more educated, I would say, they did not accept me taking the lead role in the area of business. Uh, but it was sad, it was, it was fortunate. I had the majority, I had the um, support from the villagers who were, you know, they were financially, um, they, were, they, were, they were in a financial, uh, very bad position even look after themselves in the village. Um, the subsistence, subsistence farming was not enough to cater for the demands of what they had in terms of education, in terms of the renewal, in terms of the church obligations. So these were, these were the challenges that I had to encounter. Um, not only this was, in addition to this was um, the men, people at village level lacking to understand what, what area of tourism we were venturing out in. I just, when I, when I came into this industry, all I knew was ecotourism. But little did I know that there was other areas of ecotourism. And attending the workshop in November, um, there was a, a workshop on sustainable ecotourism that was, um, that was conducted in November. I then figured out the area of tourism that we were actually in. It took me months to figure that bit out because ecotourism in itself was, was such a general and a, such a big word to, for, the, for people to understand. And that was, the lack of the lack of awareness of people knowing which area of tourism we were going into. Um, not only that, the biggest question that when I raised, when I had proposed for the idea to venture into ecotourism, the biggest question was where we we're going to get the money from. Um, that for Fijian for Fijian uh, Fijian community owned business, that is that that's a big drawback. Not having any funds to set set up the business. Um, we would not have access to loans. We did not have an asset. We did not, we just basically had the land. So it was, the challenges for me was to try and help them understand what our asset were. Um, and people were not aware that our, the basic life, whatever they were doing in the village was an asset themselves. It was their culture, the food, the people, the land, the water, the trees, the landscape. Um, I'm from Namosi. Namosi is very renowned for uh, its majestic views in terms of the mountains, uh, the rivers, just it's different. It's just a different atmosphere altogether. And people take it for granted because they were born, they were raised and they, were, they live there every day. They've never gone out to experience what it was outside of Namus. So it was them, it was, that was one of the challenges trying to help them understand that the asset in itself, what we were selling was our culture. I, I did not believe in commercializing our culture. I mean, I worked in the tourism industry uh, for two years, and I saw that it was, I saw that a few of the things that were done was not right, but I've always kept it to myself. So I thought, okay, the opportunity came, the opportunity came up. This is an area that I would advocate to them that not to compromise a culture. Whether it was coming into the village, the presentation of Yangona, these were things that I had teach. I was self-taught. I went through the industry system uh, like Mr. Zora had shared. He went through the tourism industry to understand what it's like. And he was able to do that. So I think with that background, I was able to apply that and, and do the training myself. And that, that, was, that was the most difficult bit of it. Um, 
other challenges that I encountered was uh, we had uh, youths, youths who were school leavers. Um, an area of tourism that we were venturing out into required a lot of, it was a high risk because people would go up um, on hikes and that was a waterland tracking. So the first thing that I came to mind was they needed to be certified. Um, that, there I went, I sent them to first aid training at the Red Cross, they got certified, um, the, but still, that was still not enough. We had to do mock exercises with our military families or soldiers to put, through, put them through uh, real life instances or situations where there was uh, a serious an injured uh, guest on the tracks. It was it was a return eight kilometers hike. So we got everyone engaged into understanding what tourism we were going into. Um, that in data was also um, data was also one of the challenges we encountered because I had to convince we we had to convince uh, um, the people why we were going into this industry. And people were like, well, "We're we going to get the market. We're we going to get the people to come to Namus." That was one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest questions you were asking. So I went out um, and did my research. I met MC Triple T. They, were, they played a significant role in providing us data, post COVID data from Tourism Fiji, indicating a shift. So people moved to a more cultural, environmental conscious, and communal, uh, communal tourism. No one knew this. Um, people, industries knew this, but not people on the ground. So it was it was a big bonus for us because we played that to our advantage. And we made sure we tailor-made our services to suit the guest demands. Um, so that was a, a that was a big plus for us. Um, and uh, SPTO had conducted a training on tourism trainers for tourism recovery that had a lot of modules around pricing uh, in terms of market access, in terms of marketing. They had tools and modules that was significant in assisting, um, like Zora said, it was everything was about self-learning, and I went into that and I went into that area of trying to self-educate myself through these different platforms. It was great. I really appreciated it because I was able to boldly speak and boldly train uh, the team on the ground. Um, so these were courses that assist us, uh, assisted us through. Another one of the challenges is. Um, we did not give our services out to the inbounds and out, outbounds to operators solely because we wanted to learn. We wanted to do things ourselves. Um, so one of the actions that was taken was every time we would um, service our guests every weekend, we would sit down and say, what, what did the uh, guest feedbacks were very important. We, we prioritized guest feedback because it would help us, would help in improving about the services that we provided to the guests. Um, we played on that. I had to make sure remind them that they were to participate up to industry level. Uh, one of the uh, one of uh, I think one of the support I would recommend, and I sat down last week in consultation with the Vanu of Namosi, these are elders, um, advocating the area to shift and provide, you know, come on, jump onto the platform, this particular area of tourism, which is sustainable ecotourism. And one of the things I learned was there was a lack of government and community collaboration, or there was no advocacy. They didn't even know what this was. And that, that in itself was sad. They didn't even know the available, um, the available uh, programs that were out there. We were lucky because we got jumped on Triple GI program. Our youths, uh, we participated. There was four of our youths that participated in that program and we secured grants. So I'm very happy to say to date, we still have not taken any bank loans. We don't have any financial commitments to the banks, even during a low season, like we don't have bookings right now, we don't have anything to worry about. And we go about our normal lives and wait for the season to pick up. But that does not stop us from looking for other avenues to have uh, capacity building. And I share this. One of the things that I would like support from on the ground is a lot more collaboration between the, the uh, government and communities or private sectors that I think one of the biggest um, agencies that helped us was Talmatrex. That was Marita Mani. She played a very significant role in uh, mentoring me right through the journeys. And I picked up where, where, where I was, you know, where I lacked. And I think another area that I was trying to get access to was insurance. That, that for us, for small two operators like us, that's really hard to get by. So I'm hoping that in the coming months or in the future, we will be able to sit on that platform and have insurance. It's great. I mean, it's it, it's an added asset and value to us. I mean, the policies, the waiver forms are there, but it's nothing like when you have insurance because then we have a direct 
access to international guests coming on our platforms. Another, I think one of the support areas that I, that I, I would like uh, for the communities is um, just a lot more collaboration because it looks like people on the ground want to be part of this industry, but they don't know how to. They don't know how to, they don't even have data to support what avenues. I'm happy to have said uh, in one of the webinars, this conservation tourism coming up. We're, we're, we're in the area of adventure tourism. I think that was what I learned of when I sat in the November sustainable tourism, where Japan took the lead on this. And then I learned that there was actually rural tourism, this adventure tourism, this community tourism. I didn't get, you know, I, I was not made aware of this. I'm not a tourism, I, I don't have any tourism degree. I mean, accounting economics, uh, I have that background with me, but I don't have that aspect of tourism. So it was great learning for me because if I go down to the communities, they understand what rural is, they understand what adventure is, they understand what communities, that's what Fijian culture is about. And this is what guests come for, communities. They come uh, to be part of the local cultures. They wanna taste Fijian authentic food. And another area I think of government, I would really want government to support the shift in is provide vocational programs uh, for our youths. And I think, uh, some of the speakers spoke earlier about uh, uh, reta retaining uh, retaining our youth here in Fiji, and we've got about 25,000 people who's already left the last 12 months uh, through that program. That's a big loss because we can see a, a gap um, in, in the rural areas. The, older, the seniors, they don't have youths planting, replanting any food for them. So I think that a vocational centers or vocational training centers to have, uh, to send our youth, rural youths to the to these uh, programs and bring them back and run businesses and be part of this business, it, it will be really great because right now we don't have that. I, I, a youth would, would be bold enough to be part of the tourism and participate in the different activities if they're certified. So right now we have first aid responders are certified. They're very bold to be tour guides. They're professional tour guides. Um, and we've even assisted uh, We've even assisted, oh, another challenge, sorry, I forgot to mention is lease. Lease with TLTB is a big, it's a big uh, thing and it's, it's an administrative uh, issue on its own. Um, but we operated our business um, out without a lease for six months and we're now going for a lease application because we need access to government grants to further expand the business. I think that that was one of the challenges I, I failed to mention earlier. And I would like to, I would like to mention that um, operating on Matangali lands, it's okay to do without, but if you need access to grant, you need a lease. And this is part and part of the, the requirements. Um, yeah, I guess that, that's, uh, that's just the support areas that I would, I would really want government and the private sector is, is just to work more closely with communities. And I know 18% of MSME contribute directly to GDP. So if we can get a boost on the lower left, be part of the business, uh, business community at the grassroots level to then jump onto this platform, given the right spot on the ground, it would be great. And we, it would be really great. Um, Yes, I think that's uh, that's about it. Oh, just the last thing. Um, I think people in, I mean, I would give an example for Namosi. They only knew about cooperatives, but they, they were not aware that there were grants available with MC, to MC Triple T, like IHRD or Ecotourism or other grants. So I think they had no, they had no idea of that. And I think only a few of us had taken advantage and jumped onto that platform. So I think advocacy on the manual level it would be really awesome. Thank you, Tatishma. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, very inspiring story. And definitely, uh, there's grant available for ecotourism, for SMEs uh, with the HRDP, uh, with the Ministry of uh, Trade and SMEs. Uh, and yes, definitely, uh, we are working alongside uh, the director uh, HRDP to promote more on this uh, platform. I think he has also been speaker in these uh, sessions uh, I think a few sessions we have had. And um, so thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so colleagues, um, we have come to an end of part one of the session. Uh, and thank you so much to the panel for taking our time to share with us your stories and experiences. And uh, now I will hand over to my co-facilitator, Ms. Marita Manli, to take us through the Q&A sessions. Uh, over to you, Marita.
Um, Bula, everybody, thank you so much for all of those um, inspiring um, uh, panelists in terms of your talks. I, I'm hopeful that we have some up and coming entrepreneurs on the call today to, to, to learn some of that. I know we also have some very experienced entrepreneurs on the call, um, and I'm sure there's been lots of questions that you've all um, uh yeah, you've all thought about during the during the chat. There's a few immediate ones that have come through on the chat. Um, one relates to um, uh, the lease that you mentioned, uh, Matalita. So Ritesh and Rossi were both asking if you could share a little bit more about the type of lease that you're currently applying for as a, um, as a tour you. operator. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, Marita. Um, just to answer your questions, uh, we've been advised to apply for the ecotourism lease by TLTV. That, that's the lease that we're applying for that, um, that relates to the area of tourism that we're, uh, we're, we're in. Thank you. Naka Matalita, Rossi or Ritesh, did you want to um, unmute yourself and, and ask any follow-up questions or did that answer your question? Okay, looks like it answered Ritesh's question. Um, and I will just go back through the chat. There's, if you if you are on the panel, have a look through the chat. There's lots of um, congratulatory comments in there. So I'm just searching for any other questions. Um, I can't see any immediately. So I'll just open the floor up to anybody who wants to raise their hands or to unmute to ask um, any of the panelists um, on the call a question. Otherwise, I have lots of my own, but I'll put it out to the floor first. <laughs> We're a nice, small, intimate group of 30 this morning. So don't, don't feel um, like you can't just unmute yourself um, or raise your hand if you have a question. Then maybe I'll dive into some of mine while we wait for, for people to, to have a bit more of a think about their questions. Um, several of you mentioned finance uh, in terms of either um, accessing finance or not ask, deciding not to try and access finance. And I know that this is a challenge for many um, small businesses as they're trying to scale. Um, so I wondered if each of you would be able to share a little bit, Matalita, you talked about it directly in terms of um, not requiring um, access to finance um, to start up the way that you did. Um, but I wondered if the other panelists could just touch on whether you have tried and successfully accessed kind of formal loans, or how did you find the finance to scale your, your businesses? Maybe starting with Zorro, if that's okay. Thank you. Uh, certainly. Um, well, for me, finance uh, plays a vital role for me to start up my business. So uh, why, what I had done was, I think, growing up, um, I've always been in sort of a survival mode, just so saving as much as I could and living off things which I could reuse, recycle, and um, reduce. So for me, with the, with the cafe, I started off the coffee hub. Um, so what I had done my first stage was I had started collecting a lot of equipments before initially stepping into owning a space. And when the time came for me to, um, I, was, uh, I was approached to, to get involved in this cafe. Uh, at the end of the back road is basically where the coffee hub started. So what I had done was, uh, with all, all the savings that I had, I had done a deposit and then I had started operating the business and my main focus was to continuously, see, continuously pay off the, um, uh, the debt that I had starting up the business. So that was just basically from my day-to-day -day operation of the business. Um, once that was done, uh, mostly uh, when, when I talk about evolving, my business was basically mostly um, cleaning. Cleaning a space makes a very big difference. And then um, reusing. So what I used to do was I used to pick up couches from the roadside, get it, get it uh, posted, uh, reupholstered, and using it in a cafe to generate a form of revenue for me. So uh, buying uh, secondhand church pews from places. And that's, that's how I sort of used it in the cafe to generate revenue for me. So that's, these are some of the things 
some of the techniques that I used to gen generate finance for me. Um, initially, I was very fortunate that I came across the uh, uh, BLP grant, which I had applied for. And with that grant, I was able to open my outlet in Bar. So that became a working, uh, sort of a working uh, project for me and BLP, which was the grant for me to open my bar outlet. So that's how I used that. And then um, there's the things that you need to um, send reports, send back. So I send them the whole, my expense and this and this and um, whatever my business uh, expenses was. So that's, that was the answers that they needed. So there were some of the techniques which I used. Um, other ones, other techniques for finance, which I used as well were um, not really technically a monetary value, but sort of a, just a, a mileage, adding mileage to my business was collaboration, working with other social media platforms. So if I was a food and beverage uh, company, I would work with a clothing line or a spa, perhaps that's a Deborah Nama Spa and uh, Tracy Farrington Boutique. So these are the companies that we work with to collaborate where we all reach a, a milestone in terms of our marketing. So these are some of the things that boost, uh, helps us boost our revenue uh, and things like that in the business. So, uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Zora, for sharing that. And I think one of the things that you've Thank all you. talked about is collaboration and, you know, how that can be such a positive um, tool, for, tool for growth, um, which is great to hear. So maybe I'll just move over to Siti Beni, um, if, if you're willing, sir, just to share a little bit about um, finance and how you, how you accessed finance in order to grow your, your business whether you've taken out formal loans or whether you access any other type of finance. Um, it's a regular, I'm on a few business, you know, Viber groups, and it's a regular, almost weekly um, chat in our conversations about how difficult it is to access formal finance. So I'd be really interesting to, interested to hear your, your story. You just need to unmute, there we go. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. So, um, especially uh, we started our family business in 2015. Uh, so, in 2015, our first weekend, I used to be a rugby player. I played for Fiji uh, in Junior World Cup, and uh, and I went out uh, playing rugby in Australia. And uh, and I came back. I've got some cash with me, which is I uh, used to deposit few of my vehicle to loan it. Uh, our first van, I um, I started off uh, our first van. How I did that payment was, I gave a deposit to my cousin, and I start uh, paying directly to him. Uh, there was a, a monkey face highest 1999 model Toyota. So that was our first vehicle. Uh, how I pay off that vehicle is that I first I came down to Fiji, and my cousin. Uh, van was broke down and asked him if I can give you a thousand dollar, thousand five hundred dollars, and then I'm going to uh, Australia now and I'll pay off the seven thousand. So it's a 1999 model, uh, monkey face. So I start paying off every every week, uh, give him one thousand, one thousand, and just after a few months, and uh, I clear it off. So that was our first vehicle. That's how I, I, I pay off. And uh, when I started to grow, I have few uh, cash from Australia. I play rugby in Australia and I study and I do some part-time work. And I cash out our vehicle, uh, two of our cars. And then the, 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 the loan that I did was my first loan was uh, BSP, uh, Bank South Pacific. Yeah, and uh, we loan our first van and start from there we and I, I use mostly I use a loan I just pay the deposit and then loan the vehicle from um, I got uh, merchant finance um, BSP and credit Corp. so I use those uh, companies to uh, uh, take out or fill my vehicles I have uh, uh, 25 uh, vehicles at the moment so uh, fleet of vehicles, uh, buses, fair small buses, and uh, 
Yeah, so it's all land alone and mostly, you know, coming from the village, eh? it's okay, people, we always scared of loan. Eh? So uh, like sharing with uh, what Matilita was saying, it's really true. And I'm really inspired by what he said, what she said. Yeah, so in business, uh, how we grow it, uh, yeah, we, we actually uh, just look for the deposit. Uh, once we have a business, like there's a door. Um, when I, my first contract was the Nathan Dollar Golf, Nathan Dollar Golf in, uh, in Nathan Dollar, where I'm from, I'm from San Sana. So I share profit with the landowners. That's how I took over the Nathan Dollar Golf. So that was uh, uh, yeah, just a deposit. I just look for the deposit and uh, put away the deposit, saving, you know, saving the deposit until you have the deposit and you have another door, another business. And then I just drop the deposit and uh, 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 negotiate with a uh, uh, loan, and uh, yes, yeah, so I haven't uh, come across any loan that uh, declined, and which is I'm so grateful that uh, God is blessing our family business. Yeah, and um, just now I open up uh, after pandemic, I open catch a water taxi, so I start looking into the water. Um, first boat I bought is was a 15 packs, and uh, it's luxury boat and uh, transferring guests from uh, Port General to Castaway. So, and now I'm about to, um, uh, there's a grant that I've been speaking with all the ministers in, uh, in Suva, and they've been telling me more. I've learned more about uh, going up to Suva and talking to the ministers and they've been telling me, <laughs> hey, do you know you can uh, use the grant? And I was like, oh, is there a grant here? Yeah. Okay, man, I never know all these things. Yeah, so I learned more. I, I, I met uh, Zorro in the Nandi and met Zorro in Suva. He was talking to his mates. Yeah, so I've been talking to them, uh, doing all these grants. And yeah, so I'd love to share these grants. Hey, it's uh, uh, now at the moment, $1,000 uh, grant that uh, the, the, the trades, Minister of Trades are giving eh, to all Fijians. So that's what I'm using to buy another new boat. And uh, most of my vehicles are just under deposit and loan. And most of it are already cleared off. Winaka. <laughs> Winaka level, Mr. Nomanga. Yeah, really great to hear your experiences. And congratulations. That's quite a success story in dealing with multiple credit institutions. <laughs> most of us give up after one. <laughs> That's right. Um, so really, really great to hear your story. <laughs> the Toyota monkey face. That was and a I first time. A... <laughs> <laughs> oh, and great to hear about you expanding and using your experience into the into the ocean transfers as well. Um, I can yeah. see that you're always um, really active on the social media groups um, uh, of the me. Coral Coast kind of goers. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> Like Zoro Great said, you know, everything starts from social media. So I think <laughs> I've been catching all these things from there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I've uh, the, the grant from the Ministry um, of um, trade. trade, External Trade Cooperatives of SMEs, I think that's their new name, um, has come up a few times. So I wonder, Jotty, um, we don't have any of your colleagues from the ministry online, but I wonder, Jotty, I've put the link in the chat. Would you want to say a little bit just about Sorry, the integrated I, yeah. team? I think it just break down. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Uh, yeah. So, um, yes, uh, unfortunately, the director couldn't be in this call, but we can share his email address uh, and, and uh, you can reach out with regards to the forms of, uh, and, and they, apart from the grant, they also do community awareness uh, and uh, come down to the community. And if you put your proposal in with us and we can work with them together with Ministry of Tourism, and they will uh, come uh, to the community and, and explain how the grant works and how further you can develop your, your product. Uh, an experience. Uh, so, uh, Marika, maybe we can share his uh, details uh, to those who want to connect with uh, him. Yes, we can do that. We can after the call, will will everybody will receive an email with um, some of the links that have been shared in the chats and the and the recording. So we can do that. 
Um, Joshua, would you like to share anything on while we're on the topic of finance? Would you like to share anything in terms of the experiences of, of other businesses that you've worked with? Thank you, Marita. Thank you to the other panelists as well for sharing your experiences. Just from my end, uh, for me, uh, in terms of finance, I always, um, uh, businesses, they approach me and they ask me, okay, uh, what accessing finance, uh, what are the opportunities out there? Um, so what I normally ask them is to explain their business model to me. If they're able to explain it clearly, okay, if I'm able to understand, then you know, it makes it, um, that's, a, that's the first step for them towards, okay, in terms of applying for grant or applying for loan. If they explain it to me and I do not get it clearly, then what about the other bankers or where you're trying to apply for, uh, for loan? That's one key thing, explaining about your business, uh, business model. Uh, secondly, is uh, one of the key things that always uh, that irritates me is when uh, when entrepreneurs or people that want to go into business, they are um, setting up their business to try and align to strategic objectives of grant where they will to access funding. You know, rather than them being getting their own ideas, this is one of them them assessing the market. Where there's opportunity, there's customers out there that will be able to buy. Uh, what are the resources that I need? Instead of them coming up with it, but uh, they come up with that plan and then they look, okay, what are the funding opportunities? However, most of the times when I'm talking to budding entrepreneurs, they are aligning their business model or what they do in setting up their business to where they can access funding. And I don't think so that's right because in the short term, you might access funding, but in the long term, um, you might not be sustainable. So that's just one thing that I always uh, advise entrepreneurs and that irritates me as well when I'm doing my business coaching and I advise them, see, you stay true to the first thing for doing business is that you're solving problems. And once you identify that problem, okay, and that's where funding also, you, 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 base, you base your business out of that, solving problems, okay, not to access funding. And that's that's one of the key things that I always look out for. If I'm able to catch it, and I believe also those that give out funding and grants, they are able to read that between the lines as well. Um, yeah, I, I, just just a bit of from my end, uh, uh, Marika. Thank you. Naka Joshua, um, Edward, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question directly? Yeah, thanks, thanks, Marita. Um, this is a question that I've been you know, trying to, or well, an issue I've been grappling with for a very long time in my work with MSMEs across the Pacific. I mean, there's a lot of focus in terms of accessing finance for loans and grants. And I just wanted to get the views of the entrepreneurs in this forum on what are their thoughts on you know, other forms of finance, for example, you know, angel investors, venture capital, and so forth. Because I really feel that, you know, we haven't got into those areas of uh, access to finance and we're still within that you know grant and loan sort of mentality at the moment thank you naka edward um would any of the panelists like to talk about um any other kind of forms of finance um such as angel investors or venture capital or partnership models um that you've that you used in terms of solving um some of your financing issues Feel free, any of you, to unmute and, and jump in. Thank you, Marita. Uh, I'll just jump in from my experience and working with one or two entrepreneurs uh, in terms of accessing finance. Uh, they've actually uh, got an angel investors. Uh, and talking in terms of angel investors, these are friends who are willing to put in funds for the startup of his business. It was done informally and through... Uh, directly with that business and his um, couple of friends. And when he did that, one of the key challenge or the key thing that he had to put is the trust and confidence in him using that money and being accountable for it. So what he did is that he was able to set up an online platform whereby he updates every, uh, every payouts or every interest that is added on to the investment that has been done. And this 
there was about I believe five to six investors. They had their own accounts on that uh, online platform, and every month the the owner, the entrepreneur, will be updating uh, online through that platform. So through that, and he was able to, and then the the dividends that was added on, and at the end of the year, then he will be paying out certain dividends uh, through that. So that's just uh, those two examples that um, I came across to entrepreneurs who are using that as to raise funds um, for their business. Thanks so much, Joshua. Would anybody else like to, to share any experiences? I think from, from my experience, it, it happens quite often that, um, you know, uh, angel and in inverted commas investors, there might be friends or family members, um, but often that happens without much structure. So it's a, it's good to hear about um, some of the examples you mentioned, um, Joshua, because because it can also be risky, right? If you're if you're getting into business with friends or family, there's a lot of um, complications that come with that in terms of thinking that through it in detail. Um, it can be great, um, but it can also raise its own own challenges. Um, there's a conversation happening in the chat about public liability insurance, and I know this comes comes up quite a lot for small operators. Um, so um, Mr. Nawanga was sharing um, that you get yours from New India. Um, I think Dominion Insurance, um, I know my friends at Namasi Eco Retreat use them. Um, we use a broker um, in Nandi, um, IHL. Um, and so actually, I don't actually know because I'm not the ops manager <laughs> that is with. Um, but I know that um, public liability insurance comes up quite regularly. So if people do have any contact details or great people within these insurers that you would go, yep, yeah, these guys understand SMEs and understand how challenging it can be for small businesses, then please do feel, feel free to share those um, with the group um, if you have some recommendations. Um, Maria, would you like to un unmute and just ask the question? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I was just curious to hear a little bit more um, from Josue about the um, the angel investor arrangement you just described. Very intriguing. Um, so is that a, a platform uh, based overseas that uh, they had uh, subscribed to for, to create that sort of uh, feedback and accountability? Thank you, Maria, for the question. In terms of the platform, um, I'm, I'm okay. The, the business is Clean Water Technologies. That's how he is able to set up his business. I believe you, some of you might know him, Elias O'Connor. He used a platform to get in investors who were his friends. In terms of the platform itself, I believe it was off the shelf and he, it was customized to fit his business, uh, what he's trying to do is for his business. Um, I'll drop in an email. Um, I, I'll put my email in the chat box and I can connect you with Elias O'Connor and you can get more information uh, regarding that platform as well. I hope that's uh, okay, Maria. Mm. Naka. All right, team, any more um, questions? And thank you, um, Beatrice, for sharing Rita's um, yes, number. Rita. Yes, who, who, who had a question? Matalita, please go ahead. Yes, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, Edward had earlier mentioned about uh, another form of financing, if we could think of even that particular one that Josh had mentioned and venture, joint venture. I, I, I don't know if I heard him correctly. Uh, I think it would be an absolutely great idea, but the issue would be, uh, as Maria mentioned, is trying to understand what these other structures or what, what these other options are available and understanding uh, what they are and how we fit in or how it will expand the business. Um, yeah, I, th I think if, if for, for myself, I don't even understand what this, what what they are. If we can get an understanding of what they are, then we probably can work towards it. That that's that's just from my from from me. Thank you. Just so did you want to come back on that and just um or Edward, and just share a little bit more about um, kind of, I mean, what's what's interesting from my side is this whole conversation around angel investors, impact investors, you know, it's been going on for a few years. Um, 
And impact investors particularly, I just want to share our story, which is not a great one, um, is that I've spoken to an awful lot of people who claim to be impact investors. And in theory, impact investors are interested in more than just financial returns. So if you're generating you know, social outcomes, environmental outcomes, um, then when I started some of these conversations, my understanding was, okay, well, surely that means then the rate of financial return they want is going to be lower. Except most of the impact investors I've spoken to are no different from most of the banks and they want the same rate of return that the banks do. So a lot of conversations and not much from our perspective, not much um, progress kind of in the in the impact investment space. Very keen to hear if anybody else has had more successful um, conversations. Uh, but it is a growing market. And I'm sure as with all of these things, um, procedures and processes will get more streamlined. Uh, so hopefully in the not too distant future, there will be um, investors and investment funds that um, are a little bit more tailored to the, the markets and the kind of um, size of businesses that we have in Fiji, which I think is, is also part of the challenge. I think it's, it's often a real challenge for impact investors to invest in very small businesses. And they're interested just as everybody else is in, you know, in scaling opportunities and, and returns on their investment. Um, so yeah, just sharing a little bit from from my side. Um, but if anybody else wants to jump in, I think Joshua, you're un unmuted. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree to uh, with you, uh, Marita, in terms of impact investors. Um, I've also yeah tried to work with a couple of uh, engaging impact investors to come and invest with some of the businesses that are really well established in Fiji. Um, and it didn't. Uh, they just came, did the assessment, and they went back. And exactly what you just mentioned uh, in terms of the rates and what they were asking for in terms of the returns was just sort of similar to what finances uh, offer. Now, then we then I dig deep into what they were, their criteria and the requirements. It is suited for developed markets. There's nothing the criteria requirements they come with the, the context of what uh, they assess our markets with in terms of our business is based on the ones that they've I've gotten out of the developed market. So there's nothing that is specifically for our developing markets here in the Pacific. And that is one of the key gaps in trying to uh, connect impact investors with our local uh, businesses here in Fiji and also in the, in the Pacific as well. So this is just yeah, uh, my experience in terms of working with uh, impact investors. Uh, thank, thank, thank you so much. much. Yeah, please go ahead, Edward. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I think Matalita has really summed it up well because she says she's not aware of those different kind of, uh, you know, financial uh, packages. And I think this is something that hasn't been rolled out and, you know, made, uh, entrepreneurs made aware of. And I think it's because a lot of this financial inclusion, access to finance is pushed by the banks and, you know, they, they push loans. And then when development partners come in, sometimes they push grants. And these two seems to be the main sort of, you know, packages that have been pushed. So, you know, if we are able to bring in other, you know, uh, sources of access to finance, like venture capital, uh, you know, uh, angel investors and so forth. I mean, we, we get about $1 billion of remittances a year. Imagine trying to harvest that remittance. And instead of, you know, my uncle from overseas sending, you know, me a $1,000, uh, you know, as a sort of a social sort of thing to say, buy your food and so forth. But, you know, I use, send it to me as an econo in, through an economic lens. You know, here it would go invest at $1,000 and try to set up a business. I think that's more empowering. So I think there's a lot of opportunities to how to, you know, use these different packages. And, but it needs to be introduced. And I think government can play a very important role here. That said, if you look at, you know, there's an opportunity also to elevate MSMEs to sort of the, the investment platform. Uh, you know, Investment Fiji, they are, you know, they are, uh, their regulation has changed. They are now a more of a promotional agency and, you know, they promote big businesses. I don't see any reason why they can't promote small businesses, you know, like Zoro's business to see, you know, overseas investment investors or, you know, or, or, or you know, former Fiji residents living overseas investing in their business to sort of scale it up or access other markets. So thank you. Just wanted to add that much. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. I might um, flick it back to uh, Mr. Nawanga, if that's OK, um, given that you mentioned kind of remittances, Edward, as playing a kind of a potential role in investment. Uh, Mr. Nawanga, you mentioned, you know, as a former rugby player, you, the, the way that you originally paid off your vehicles was through sending money um, from from Australia when you were playing there. Um, 
Can you can you just describe whether you know of other businesses in your area that have, have pursued or maybe former rugby colleagues um, that you know of that have done the same thing? Is that is your story common or is your story uncommon? I guess is my question. <laughs> And you just need to unmute yourself, Mr. Nwanga. Again. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the Tikinawa here from uh, Nandonga and uh, from our side, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's only myself, only us, we running a, a legit tour company from our side eh? uh, as a rugby, a rugby. Um, a background a rugby player eh? yeah um yeah i think it's only myself and my family and what do you think um what do you think could be done to support um you know people who are in the same position to kind of take the path that you that you took um is there anything that you feel the government could be doing or agencies in this space that could support more people who are potentially earning money overseas to be investing that in a business um you know for their life after rugby or for their um for their family in the future is there any anything that you think could be done to make that pathway easier um i think it's just that how you manage your money and uh, be mature because uh, rugby, uh, most of uh, rugby players are not really don't know that uh, everything comes to the end when you're in 30 years old. Eh? So once you come in 30 years old, that's the time uh, your rugby star is going down. Eh? Myself, I haven't been to that age. And then I started, uh, when I was 25 years old, I started fractured my ankle. That's where I started uh, doing my study. And I've been thinking of uh, starting off my business uh, and coming home. And uh, um, as a background, we don't have any uh, enough. We don't have enough at uh, village to support my family. So that's how I come back. And uh, yeah, so I think in, in some ways the the yeah the, the it's all about machiwa, like to be machiwa and be uh, think of your family and. Uh, uh, if you if your faith is uh, in the right way, like you know, because um, myself, I, it's the only thing is that I, I, I all my success is all about believing uh, and following the footstep in my um, how I follow my faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah? So I always thank Him for everything that I've uh, achieved. And uh, the only thing that, uh, uh, that hard for us in the village is to step out from the village is that uh, money, eh? money-wise. Eh? So um, I think the, 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 like you said, the government, eh? like a grant and all that, something like that, eh? it would be easier for other, other people that live in the village, but people that they uh, playing rugby like me and most of the Nandronga boys, they play, uh, they the more success in rugby than me. And uh, I think it's just uh, that, like that. Like I have to be, you just have to be mature with all and saving up and uh, think of your back home. Eh? Uh, think back home. You, you come from a poor family and uh, once you play rugby, it will end and make sure you think back home. When you're now overseas, don't forget your family. Think back home and put some money for your family to start off and uh, start off your deposit or something to start off your family business. I think that was my motive. Uh, thinking back home and never forget my family. Once I play rugby, I put some money aside for, for start off our family business. Uh, Naka, yeah. Mr. Nwanga, Naka. <laughs> All right, well, I'll throw it back out to the floor. Any other questions? We've talked about finance a lot, but there were lots of other things that people touched on. Um, we had a, there was a good conversation around customer service and hospitality, all sorts of different types of customer service and hospitality from community-based tourism and providing people with an authentic um, Fijian experience, Fijian food, um, village hospitality to Coffee Hub Suva and Nandi. Um, at the other, other end of the scale um, and how to create a, um, a fish and chips dish that is, is 
um, aligned to an experience, a food experience beyond just um, just your average meal. Um, so lots of discussions around kind of placing your experience or your product and, and making sure that it's resonating with your guests. Any other questions from the floor? We don't have to go the full two hours if, if we're ready to wrap up, but I want to give um, another another opportunity just for those on the call to ask any questions of our panelists or the panelists to ask questions of each other. Hi, Marita. Just uh, from me, sorry, just going back to the finance aspect, something that just popped up in mind uh, in terms of uh, accessing finance for MSMEs. I believe a couple of years ago, RBF uh, was putting together something they were going to create a platform under SPAC, something like a secondary market whereby MSMEs are able to register their businesses and then invest and then look for investors. Um, people can buy shares into those businesses. And that uh, there was, yeah, the talks were around that a couple of years ago. Um, and the requirements for businesses or MSMEs to register under SPAC, but that second, I believe it's secondary market, is not too stringent as the ones for the primary markets one. And it, I'm not sure if it's the right forum, something that can be looked into. RBF was working on that a couple of years ago, but I don't know where is it at the moment. That might be another platform that can systematically uh, push towards uh, creating angel investors, those that are from overseas, uh, Fijians that can invest back into businesses in Fiji for MSMEs. Thank you. Thank you, Jusuan. Yeah, we can certainly follow up with RBF to, to find out um, where that, that's at. Any other questions from the floor? If there are no other questions, maybe I'll throw out a wild card question to wrap us up. Um, so maybe I could ask each of the panelists, um, if you weren't doing what you are doing now, and you're looking at the market as it is today in terms of tourism entrepreneurship, and you are starting again, um, what would you do? Like, where do you feel there's a business opportunity or a market opportunity that's not currently being met in the tourism market? So maybe, you know, a business opportunity that you feel is ready for somebody to step into the space and, and develop a a small or a medium business um, that you feel is not currently being being met. So this could be from feedback that you've heard from guests or from um, you know businesses that you've worked with that say, or oh, actually we regularly get asked to do this, and I don't know anybody that's doing it at the moment. Maybe as you think, um, Watisoni has just shared some thoughts in, in the chat. And maybe uh, Watisoni, uh, if you're... One uh, thing in area. Oh. Sorry, go ahead, Matalita. Um, sorry, just to quickly answer that question, uh, just from our end, one of the greatest questions coming from our guests is the demand for campsites um, across the country. Um, that, that That's in demand. And I think, I'm not quite sure why people have not uh, gone into this space it's probably the lack of advocacy uh, but when we we started up with our with the with the adventure tourism our guests demanded for the campsite we went into campsite because of the demand and then they're calling us up to encourage other areas like the Nosori highlands um i think in bar in Vanua level to have the similar setup campsites and so i think um that's an area where whatever area whichever ministry and government should tap into because it's pretty easy set up um, with the facilities to offer this to guests, these, these travelers, these local travelers who would like to to, uh, to experience this in different parts of Fiji. So that's from, from my end. Naka um, Matalita, yeah, completely agree. And I think this is on the ministry's radar because as many of us on the call know, one of the one of the barriers that um, is currently being talked about is the hotel licensing requirements and, and a differential arrangement for smaller operators. But yet we regularly also get asked about where people can go camping. So yeah, great one to throw into the mix. So we've got campsites who, I think Joshua had his hand raised. Yeah, for me, well, um, one of the key things for tourism they come in is they want to visit places and always an issue is accommodation. And I believe one of the gap 
as well as an opportunity in Fiji is caravan tourism. Um, we've got uh, community-based uh, tourist uh, businesses that are popping up here and there. So establish that caravan tourism, a business that um, uh, rents out caravans for tourists to come in, uh, use for one week or two weeks, how long they want to stay in uh, here in Fiji. That's just an opportunity for me. Thank you. Naka, Joshua, maybe, maybe something for Mr. Nawanga to think about long term. <laughs> um, so who, maybe I'll come to Zoro next. You're just on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, there's been some great uh, opportunities um, that's been highlighted. Uh, for me, like I like I had mentioned before, I think for from the government probably streamlining a lot of licensing and making it easier for anyone and everyone how to register the business and start operating. I know there's a lot of uh, laws and regulations out there which protects the the people as well, but at the same time we need to probably stream on a lot of things to make it easier for entrepreneurs as well um for them just to get started and of course they can be monitored or making sure that they do the right thing so that's one of the main things um secondly i think um if for me if it wasn't for the coffee business um i'm very passionate about anything and everything that i do um what i have seen around the country uh we have uh, people who've been doing the same thing for the past um, couple of years. And due to COVID, a lot of people had to deal with it the hard way. And uh, hence the reason why they had to shut their doors. And for me, the benefit for me was to basically, I opened my doors and I put forward change. So that's how my business grew. So I think um some of the platforms where uh the the television and the 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 uh, the broadcasting broadcasting corporation companies they can use and work with probably other um ngos and governments to um to to educate a lot of youths out there on businesses and um investor schemes and what are things that can actually um just use this platform to raise more awareness and educate our our people. So these are some of the things that I believe that's lacking. Uh, most of these platforms are used for mostly um, unnecessary use and doesn't add any value or anything in any person's normal standard of living or lifestyle. So mm -hmm. if we can use these platforms to do more educational um, awareness, um, you know, this is where perhaps the investments um, concept, the grants, the loans, the, um, the, the short causes that's been offered to the youth. So this is what this for me personally, I, would, I believe is a great platform where everyone tunes in while they're on the bus, they're on the, on the car, they're traveling, they're on mixed tours, um, you know, so self-development, this is where everything kicks in. Um, one of the things that I have noticed is, for example, TikTok. Um, I, I read about TikTok uh, China, and I came, I came across this video where the founder of TikTok does not allow its, uh, his own children to use TikTok because they are 18 and 17 years old. So that's a big wake-up call for us. You know, we, we are distracted by so many things out here where we can use these tools to educate our people. Um, also, one thing that I always was on a verge of doing was before I started Coffee Up, was our, I grew up in bar selling mangoes. So a good example for me was I used to actually polish my mangoes with the, the when you pick fresh mangoes and you polish it with the juice. So what happens is when you set it up on the roadside, it gives that shine to the mangoes. So any person driving, I'm like, oh my God, there's some nice mangoes out there. Um, so when I moved to Nandi, I came across uh, uh, people selling coconuts and I did a math. I was like, a, co a person selling coconut for a dollar. So that's just coconut on its own. You cut it open, you sell it for a dollar. And for me, I was on a verge of doing the same thing. I was gonna, I was gonna put a nice hibiscus garnish on a coconut. 
And I was gonna also probably get a ASCII and have an option where you have chilled coconuts or you have room temperature coconut. You put a nice garnish to it and just a bit of love and um, um, and this is where social media kicks in, you know, just make it photogenic and just giving that wow factor. Yes, you can sell the same okay. coconut. For <laughs> all the things that I think of. <laughs> so yeah, it's just adding a little bit more flavor to how we do things in life. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, yeah. Zoran. I complete, completely agree. I've never understood why I've been to Apia a few times and you can get boo in every coffee shop, every restaurant, you know, I've and I, I don't understand why. <laughs> It's not as common as yes. it should be here. Yes. So thank you. Thank you so much for laying out the challenge again for somebody <laughs> to pick that one up. Um, <laughs> Mr. Nawanga, over to you. If you weren't doing um, mixed transfers and tours, um, what would you do? I mean, you've mentioned one, the ocean transfers you've already gone into, but is there is there anything else that if you were starting again, you would go, oh, that's something that is a real gap in the market? Yeah, I think uh, just steal my idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, yeah, that that's what one uh, one idea that I have. Um, first, I'm I'm uh, my next move now is to get a what uh, wet and wild adventure. I want to build in uh, Fiji. Uh, there is one in Vanuatu, wet and wild in uh, Vanuatu, so I'm gonna do one in Fiji as well. So. Uh, that is uh, my next move and uh, building up a, a caravan and that is a villa in my land. It's a nice view from Mommy Bay. Yeah, so that's it. So just don't steal my idea. Naka, Mr. Nwanga. Naka. Um, All right, team. Um, so I'll do a final. Any other questions from the group before I hand back over to Jotty to wrap us up? Indeed. Yes, please, Mr. Nawanga, if you wanted to unmute. Uh, yeah, no, I'm just looking forward to have a coffee at uh, Coffee Hub now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could do with a coffee at Coffee Hub as well. <laughs> Uh, All right, Jotty, I can't see any other um, hands raised in the group, so back over to you. Thank you, Marita, and thank you, everyone. Very interesting and inspiring discussion today. So since we have come to an end for today's session, um, on behalf of the Fiji yes. government and the Ministry of Tourism and Civil Aviation, I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for joining today, especially to our panel, a very interesting panel today, uh, for sharing your stories and, and your um, uh, opportunities out there in the market and what are the constraints that you have shared and how we can overcome them. And to the participants, thank you for your contribution and all the questions that were coming in and all the comments and uh, suggestions that came through today. Uh, thank you so much for that. And not forgetting, Marita, thank you for your support throughout these sessions that we have been having. We have had 13 sessions up till now and all the recommendations that are coming through. Thank you for that, for facilitating in terms of collating all this information for the development of the NSTF. Uh, so we have clever everyone and this is not a goodbye. We will definitely be in touch. Thank you so much. Nakamode. Okay, everybody, take care. Okay, Molly, coffee time. Molly, Molly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Vinaka, Molly.